the uh, what are some of the things that we see coming down the pipeline and uh, what do we want to do with them? Uh, in terms of the question, the first question for us was why? Is this why why do we want these in our school? Uh, one of the things that's unique about ASB is that it's a place where we have a very uh, transient population. Uh, we want to make sure that the educational experience that's here, if we're going to serve our students well, we're going to make sure, we need to make sure that we're empowering them to carry that uh, education and carry those connections that they make with uh, teachers and students forward past the average of three years that they're here. Uh, another is that the order of skills that are necessary uh, for students has changed uh, at this point. Uh, the corpus of knowledge that's available at your fingertips, uh, the information that you can pull up uh, with quick searches is immense. And so uh, what you need to be able to do in the world is different from when that wasn't available. And third is that we really want to, tied into that, we want to model our change in the world. We want to make sure that students are given the opportunity to take the tools that are there and we really allow them to become, to model the types of adults, the types of professionals that they'll become. Uh, we want to give them the power of social technology to really shape the zeitgeist of their world. Uh, and the last thing is we want to recognize who these students are. It's, I think that we can all acknowledge uh, students from the age of 13, sometimes younger, are on uh, social media websites. And if we don't deal with that reality, then we're not really respecting who they are as people. And so that was also a driving, that was also a driving force in, in, in our decision to integrate social tech in our school. Uh, to give a quick definition, social technology is content neutral. Uh, it's a platform for things to be shared. Uh, it allows conversations, it allows networking, uh, to share data and beyond just sharing data, to collaborate on projects together. Uh, the tools give us the ability to publish our ideas, communicate interesting content we find and create. Uh, some of the things that we're talking about when we talk about Google, about social tech, the first, the, uh, is used from the youngest ages at the school are Google Docs. Uh, when I heard a teacher saying recently to another, you know, if you really want to know what's happening in those collaborative projects, you need to go to the chat column of your Google Docs because kids are in there, kids find it, even if, even if they're not told. And there's a lot of uh, back and forth, there's a lot of conversation about how things are going to be created in there. Uh, Edmodo is another example that's used at the elementary school level for a social media platform. Uh, a similar platform in the middle school and the high school are Nings. Uh, these are walled-in spaces that have been created specifically for, educa specifically for educators and for students. Uh, back channels, uh, including Today's Meet, uh, which is which uh, we're looking at the appropriateness for elementary school students, uh, all the way up to Piazza, which is a back-channeling platform uh, that's used for college and university level uh, courses. Uh, these are platforms that allow individuals to have a conversation about the lecture that might be going on uh, in front of them right now. Uh, the working back-channel, uh, uh, a room full of a room full of students can talk back and forth about what are they seeing, what are they noticing, writing down their notes, and then have an opportunity to uh, to go back to those and to and to see. Oh, I like that idea. I want I want to I want to get together with that person either in this virtual space or in a face to face conversation later. Uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter. So, what are the the goals that we have? for these technologies, what we really want to do is we want to build a personal learning network for each student. Uh, the things that we want them to be able to do with these learning networks are really threefold. Uh, the first is to work and collaborate continuously, regardless of where they are. 
I'll share with you a story from my classroom. I have a, a student in my class who their parents, the time they were able to get a vacation to go home to visit family was this week in the middle of the school year. Uh, and so she's gone. She took a 24 hour flight. She landed in the States. And the first thing that she did before anything else was she jumped into Edmodo and she started looking and seeing uh, what were people saying about the collaborative project that was going on. Uh, later on in the day, she emailed me and was checking in with me. But the, that, that is, that's one of the things that we're looking for. Are we, are we using the technology in our school to enable students to seamlessly uh, continue to work and to continue to collaborate uh, wherever they are? After that, we want to make sure that they uh, continue to have access to their peers and their teachers. Uh, that uh, regardless of where they go in their life, that their learning network is one that connects, uh, that connects them to these people. And this was one of the ideas that I started out with. The average stay for both teachers and for students is about three years. So uh, it's very different. When, when I graduated from high school, I had uh, people that were walking across the stage with me that I'd known since, uh, well, no, I, I, there was one that I had known since I was about uh, three years old. Uh, those are powerful connections. Uh, th that's, a, that's a process of, of really getting to know not just a person, but also how they think, uh, the types of projects that they work on. Uh, I trust those people to give me feedback and to check in and to, to really uh, talk to me about what they, what they see and, and where they think I should go, and I really value that more than I do most anybody else. Uh, and we want to make sure that our students don't lose that opportunity uh, by building a personal learning network, by building spaces where they know they can find those friends, they know they can find those people that they've worked with before. Uh, we enable those students to uh, to really grow in uh, powerful ways. Uh, we have one of the things that we're doing is talking to uh, students about what conversations do you have with the teachers that are left. Uh, what platforms do you use? And it, uh, you know, I've, I've walked up to fourth graders and said, you know, I know last year you talked with Mr. Jordan about math stuff. Have you talked with him yet? Now that he's teaching, he's teaching in the United States again. I say, oh yeah, I've, I've sent him emails and I was showing him some of the stuff that I was working on. Uh, and this this is stuff that's happening really informally. So we want to look at what are the things that we can do to put that to put this in place so it's a formal piece of what we do as a school. The last step that we're looking at is the ability to connect to experts. Uh, at this point, there are around 7 billion people on the planet, and 1 billion are online. Uh, of the PhDs, uh, I don't have exact numbers, but I'm going to guess that that's 100%. Uh, when, uh, if you go to school in a place where you have a research institution that's next to you, uh, where you have uh, teachers that went to school in that uh, university, there are a lot of deep ties, and you can you can connect students to experts that know more about the specific interests of particularly high school students. Uh, in in an international setting, that's not always the case. We're not always teaching in places that, or to speak just about Mumbai. We, don't, we do not have a lot of research institutions that we're tied into. And so we want to look at how can we use social technology to allow our kids to reach out to experts. Uh, what do we need to do to enable them to build a network, to reach out to people with questions that are outside the purview of uh, even the most hardworking IB teachers? Uh, because if, if that hardworking IB teacher is doing the best that they can, they're going to inspire students to reach for specifics beyond the classroom of 30 students will have some specific questions that are beyond their canon knowledge. One of the things that we have seen that is a bit of a tangent to this research and that we're still sort of playing around with is uh, the idea of how social media changes our relationship with both media and our relationship with each other. Uh, this is, and as I've said, this is a tangent, but it's something that I think is uh, really powerful and interesting. Uh, if 
if you don't mind, what I'd like to do is to sh uh, show you uh, uh, two or three minutes from a video of some individuals who are much smarter than I, who are, who are thinking about these, these same issues. Uh, one is Lawrence Lessig, and the other is a, a fellow at the Cato Institute. It's off. It's off. Can you show the URL? Uh, that's good. And then, of course, people from San Francisco saw it, and San Francisco thought they had to do the same as well. some important lessons he wants us to learn from this. Here's lesson number one. Which is obviously also something really deeply great about this. So they're acting in the sense that they're emulating the original mashup, and the guy who shot it obviously has a, a strong eye and some experience with video editing. But this is also basically just a group of friends having an authentic social moment, screwing around together, which is really familiar and kind of resonating with anyone who's had a sing-along or dance for some friends. Sure. <laughs> so that's important to from the earlier videos we looked at, because here, remix isn't just about an individual doing something alone in his basement. It becomes <coughs> a, a social freedom tip. And it's not just that it yields a different kind of product at the end. It's that potentially it changes the way we relate to each other. But all of our normal social interactions become a kind of invitation to this sort of collective expression. It's our real social lives themselves that are transmuted into art. And so that and what this libertarian draws from these two points. Our remix is about individuals using our shared culture as a kind of language to communicate something to an audience. Stage two, social remix, is really about using it to mediate people's relationships with each other. First, uh, within each video, the Brat Pack characters are used as a kind of template for performing the social reality of each group. But there's also a dialogue between the videos, where once the basic structure is established, it becomes a kind of platform for articulating the similarities and differences between the group's social and physical worlds. And then, here's for me, the critical key to what Julian has to say. A copyright policy isn't just about how to incentivize the production of a certain kind of artistic commodity. It's about what level of control we're going to permit to be exercised over our social realities, social realities that are now inevitably permeated by pop culture. So, you know, I think when I hear that, some of the things that are key are that because of social media now, we have this global world where we have people putting out templates, and every once in a while, one of those templates really catches on, and, and we find that groups are spontaneously taking these and using them to help define uh, a community. Uh, this is an example from well over a year ago. Uh, if, you, if you spend a fair amount of time on YouTube, one of the things that you might have seen recently are some videos called, uh, labeled Stuff People Say, uh, the first was Stuff Girls Say, and it was an immensely popular video. It was also a, a, a format that people could uh, copy pretty easily. Uh, and then people started uh, <laughs> doing videos like uh, Stuff Black Girls Say and Stuff uh, Guys Say. Uh, and now that it's been out there for about a month, what we're starting to see is Stuff Students Say. 
uh, if you if when I searched for it, I found uh, over a thousand videos. Uh, some of them just generic stuff med students say, but many, many, many that are, that are far more specific. <laughs> that stuff that Brown students say, stuff that Stanford students say, where uh, these are individuals that are looking to use social media to define what is this community that we're a part of? Uh, how do we sound? What are our norms? Uh, and that's a, that's a really powerful and important thing to do for any community. And the fact that, again, this is uh, an emergent property of of this technology, it's an emergent property of social media. Uh, this is, as I said, it's sort of a tangent, but one of the things that we're uh, trying to wrap our heads around is, is this something that we need to uh, that we need to purposefully build into our school? Do we need to purposely think about how uh, remixing and how the use of memes that come, uh, memes and platforms that we see outside? Uh, should be used in our school to help us define what is our culture, to help us uh, to help us build our culture. Uh, so this, those are the directions that we're going. Uh, social media, uh, the social tech team is uh, still researching. We're uh, still reading both what other experts are doing as well as. Uh, talking with and uh, surveying students at the school to see what are the practices that our students already use. Um, some of the things that we want to find out are to what extent does uh, to what extent does gaming uh, tie into uh, their their educational life, uh, and to what extent are they using social media to stay in touch already with uh, their friends that are leaving. Uh, I want to pause right there and just ask are there, are there questions from you, curiosities that you have. What was the question? The, the question was uh, about the types of social media that were available for students under the age of 13. Uh, I would say that specifically, uh, as an elementary school teacher, what, what we see students using a lot are one voice thread, uh, which is a platform where you can invite people to, you know, you can set up a voice thread and you can invite people to comment on that. Uh, Edmodo, uh, E-D-M-O-D-O. Uh, we also use uh, Today's Meet at times for back channeling inside the classroom. Uh, and uh, we use some wikis at times if we're doing collaborative projects. And then Google Docs is uh, uh, quite prevalent. Uh, when we, most of our collaborative projects uh, are done in, in that cloud space. Uh, and we find students are using them at home in school, uh, students, uh, one of the things that I found last year, again, I like to study social tech because there's a lot of emergent properties coming out. Uh, last year I was surprised to find that when I introduced Google Docs, my, my first year at the school, uh, I just meant it to be for uh, me presenting lessons and students collaborating on things that I had created, and very, very quickly, uh, I had eight-year-olds that had decided to do collaborative writing. Uh, and we're creating stories, and we're we're asking their friends in other classrooms to to edit it uh, in real time in that real classroom time. So, so are you? Uh, I think it depends on the project that you're trying to get. Um, when <coughs> we use Google, we use Google Docs for presentations all the time. Uh, when we want to. Uh, for me personally, when I want something that is graphic, uh, graphically designed, we do the text in Google Docs so that students can collaborate on writing, and then we move into Publisher, uh, because Microsoft Word is not a graphic design tool. Yeah, um, so do your eight-year-olds sign up for Google accounts, and is, do you know, notice whether Google is evolving in terms of um, letting young children use their technologies? Because a few years ago, I know, you had to be 13 to get a Gmail account. Are they changing all that? 
Uh, the school is a Google Apps school, so every student that comes in has uh, a Google Apps account. We got and even at the very even end, though they all have Google Apps accounts, they don't necessarily all have email addresses. Those accounts are all created at the sysadmin level. Right. Yeah. Uh, could you share an example of a collaborative project that you've completed through social technology? Uh, I can. I'll also say that if you're really interested, uh, when we were presenting our units of inquiry in uh, in the MPH, uh, we'll have third grade students who will talk about that, and they're going to be even better. Um, if, would that suffice, or would you like to see something right now? Can you briefly something? Okay. Uh, one of the projects that we just finished working on uh, is our uh, uh, unit of inquiry called Rights and Responsibilities. Uh, students spent a lot of time uh, working in... Uh, discussing and reading about child's rights as well as uh, uh, children who had done work as uh, students who had children who had really made change in the world. So uh, kids like Iqbal uh, Masi, who is a uh, freedom worker in Pakistan, uh, Kid Blink, who was a newsie in New York. Uh, kids who had really gone up against adult organizations and made changes in them. Uh, and then we started learning about uh, about organizations in Mumbai that were working to protect children's rights. And the students started working in Google presentations. Right, I'm going to show you the exported products. Students began working in Google presentations to put together uh, this presentation. Uh, they collaborated to find uh, color schemes. They uh, they had teacher help to split the project into individual chunks that each student could work on. Uh, they spent time critiquing each other's work, uh, and. Once this was created, the students took it to classrooms around the school, uh, showed it to other students, asked them, uh, asked them to make donations to help these organizations out, collected those donations, and then took those donations to uh, to these uh, offsite NGO schools, uh, shared with them what they had done, uh, had conversations, and asked them, you know, what, were the ideas that we had about your lives correct? Um, and and now at this point where we are exploring, are there ways that we can now use this connection that we have with these outside schools to allow them to make deeper connections, make social connections, uh, work on projects together and collaborate with uh, yet another level uh, here in Mumbai. And have you used uh, social technology in ASV in terms of teachers? How have teachers collaborated in terms of using social technology? Some example? Uh, I mean, uh, so one Google Docs is. Community, right? mm -hmm. Some kind of document We have, in terms of the, what teachers do, we have NINGS uh, that are fairly active. <coughs> of course, ASB Unplugged uh, runs a number of NINGS. Uh, there, when when we are meeting and doing things like the R and D team, there, I mean, there's a fair amount of just this. Uh, collaborative writing in Google Docs spaces. Uh, I, I would say one, pushing the teachers to use more social technology is not something that, we're, that, we're, that we, is the focus of our team. Um, especially, you know, we're, we're not that large a staff. We, 70 people, uh, we're all in this building together. Uh, so I would say the majority of things that we do are really face to face. Okay. Yes. So how do you manage all these things? Like you, you mentioned a few um the, the common use like with Modo and Ning. Do the do the classes actually get to choose which which platform they want to use? Or is it uniformly uh consistently used across grade levels? Uh, do the students actually are are they able to juggle all these accounts or you know I mean how is it how is it managed? Uh, <coughs> So, 
I can talk a lot about the experience in elementary school. We have uh, grade level meetings uh, every day, literally, and we have scheduled meetings with our tech coordinators. Uh, the tech coordinators come to uh, come and suggest technologies. We give feedback uh, based on what we've seen in previous years and what we've come across. Um, for our units of inquiry, we normally have uh, we have an idea of where we're heading, and we look for what are the technologies that are going to enable us to do that. So, in uh, a unit that we're looking to do uh, collaboration with schools outside of us, we say, okay, this is going to be one where we want Edmodo. Uh, but it's not something that's going to be used for every project. And so students, uh, students do not necessarily have to be up on every technology at every time. But at the same time, I've, I've been crazily impressed by the extent to which students remember what they've done. Uh, we used Prezi's for one uh, unit of inquiry at the beginning of the year. Uh, and yesterday, I gave the students an hour to make some sort of presentation or document that they were going to share with their parents uh, that night uh, to explain their homework. And half of my class decided to jump in Prezi and were throwing in graphics and making paths. Uh, so uh, I don't doubt their ability to manage uh, quite a bit. Can I answer part of that question as well? Uh, we do not uh, dictate what tools to make and uh, to right. use in the classroom. So across the board, you'll find uh, teachers using Edmodo or using names. Uh, Google Apps is the only one that's like uh, across the school. So we can't survive without it. We, if you want to share something, even if it's a PDF, we put it in Google Docs and share it out rather than send attachments as much as possible. So there's a lot of uh, openness. There's only one particular network that the whole school belongs to, and it's called our community network, which has staff and parents that are part of that network. Other than, and that's a name. Uh, okay. uh, but other than that, pretty much you can use whatever tools you like. Okay. Uh, the management of those tools in terms of the technical management accounts, etc., are handled by the tech department and all of, and all of it. We, we actually have people assigned to just create the accounts and hand it over. Okay. And then teachers and coordinators pretty much run with it yes. on their own. Okay. Does that answer your question? About yes. <laughs> can we take one more question and then we stop? Can we close? Uh, I have, yes. You mentioned that you're presenting your units of inquiry. To when? Uh, there's, there's a, his, his topic is social technologies in one thing. No, no, no. The, the question is for the student presentations, do you know what time the units of inquiry are going up? Look, look for the social studies one. Social, they'll be in social studies, they'll also be in language arts. Okay. Those are the two spaces that you find, mostly in social studies. Okay. Uh, I will. I'll close by saying it. Uh, let me actually find out what something. Uh, My email address is wanjoeyl at asbindia.org. Uh, we are looking at all times to collaborate with other educators, other classrooms. Uh, we have uh, we have a website, ASB, <coughs> ASB GCP, Global Collaborative Projects, dot org. Uh, right now, uh, we have our third grade units of inquiry up at that website, and we hope to have uh, the units of inquiry of many more grade levels. Uh, if you are interested in using social tech to uh, collaborate with students at ASB, to give your students a personal learning network that includes students uh, that are passionate uh, and tech savvy, uh, please do get in touch. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.